Yes. So, welcome everyone. We're still waiting for Vandana Shiva, but last week we also had an issue at the beginning with uh, access to Zoom, but I'm sure this will be resolved soon. One second, I'm just going live now. And we are live. Yes. So, welcome everyone to another fascinating and very important webinar on the impact of COVID-19 on the Global South. This is one of the most pressing topics at the moment. COVID-19 is uh, not just a virus that affects Europe, but it has much bigger repercussions in uh, the developing world. So therefore, today we have this great opportunity to discuss uh, the impacts with very distinguished speakers. For those of you who are joining us live on um, YouTube, you can always ask questions by tweeting us under AUB underscore FSP. This is the food security Twitter account. So please go ahead and ask us questions. Those of you who are part of the webinar, please ask us questions via either raising your hand or sending a message and I will then provide you with access to uh, speak and ask your questions. So, Mustaf, if we can ask you to uh, turn on your camera. We have what I think a very, very interesting and useful uh, panel today. Uh, from Brazil, we have Vanessa Empinotti. Vanessa is a professor uh, for water and food governance based at the Universidade Federal do ABC, which is in the Sao Paulo area. Vanessa is an agriculture engineer by training from Boulder, Colorado, and she has published numerous articles on issues around food security. And so therefore we're very pleased to have her. We also have um, Rami Zurek. Rami Zurek is uh, based at the American University in Beirut and he is a professor for landscape management, but more importantly, he is one of the key food security activists in the Middle East. He is uh, a former member of the high level panel of experts to the World Food uh, Commission based at uh, FAO. And he's been a member of the Eat Lancet Commission that identified sustainable diets for a growing planet until 2050. Then we have two of our former and current students. One is Mustaf Abdirahman. He joins us from Somalia, uh, which is particularly affected not just by COVID-19, but also by uh, the locust problem right now. And uh, he will tell us how life is right now in East Africa. And we have uh, Ibrahim Bahati, who is uh, a graduate uh, of AUB. He got his MSc in Rural Community Development. And he's joining us from Uganda today. As you can tell, he's in an amazing area, um, but he will tell us uh, a lot more about what is happening in Uganda. So we're very pleased and very delighted we have him there. Rachel, let me um, hand over to you in order to have the uh, introductory statements. Thanks, Martin. Hi, everyone. My name is Rachel Bond. I'm the coordinator for the food security program at the American University of Beirut and a colleague of Martin's. It's a pleasure to have you all with us today. Uh, we're going to kick off right now by asking each of our speakers to go in turn. They'll offer a brief introductory statement of about four to five minutes addressing this issue of COVID-19 and food systems in the global south and their perspective and the issues that they'd like to address. Then we'll move on to moderated questions. So going in no particular order, um, I'd like to please invite uh, Vandana Shiva, if you'd like to take uh, the next four to five minutes to make your opening statement, please. Um, the UN has warned that the corona pandemic is going hand in hand with a hunger pandemic. Um, and this is the case all over, including in India. India, because of our history, because of our freedom movement, because of our breaking free of the British empire, because of our teachings of Gandhi, we 
regenerated, decentralized economies based on self-organization. So a land of small farmers, small land of small retailers. And in the last 25 years of uh, corporate-led globalization, large numbers of farmers lost their livelihoods, not because they weren't producing food, but because an economic system that makes inputs costly and collapses the price of food means making a living on agriculture becomes impossible. Refugees created, they are today's migrant labor. They worked under very precarious conditions in cities. And um, the World Bank had worked on this illusion that everyone would be in the cities. When Corona lockdown hit, 8 p.m. on the 24th, with four hours notice, half of India lost its livelihoods. But because these are precarious people, and you know, their everyday work is their everyday food. Overnight, the India that was holding the economy, the India that was producing for the entire country, overnight was standing in queues for food. I get calls all the time for friends saying, please help mobilize. And I say, yes, we must give relief. According to, um, to the WHO, a billion people are going to be additional joining the ranks of the hungry. A million are going to be without food very fast and will be in starvation levels. What is protecting India is that we are a culture of compassion and people are coming out and it's primarily people feeding other people. That's what's happening. It's become kind of the national agenda. And because of the fact that I worked on food sovereignty, seed sovereignty over all these decades, uh, our farmers, and you know, I can't go visit them, they call us, they are secure. On the other hand, those who were dependent on growing cash crops, just tomato, just onions, just melons, they are the ones who have lost a livelihood because they've lost their markets. So this monoculture, cash crops, long distance supply chain system is what has collapsed in this lockdown period. Local circular economies based on food sovereignty are giving a livelihood to the producer and food to those they supply food to. That has been our experience in this period of the lockdown. And I believe post lockdown, we should ensure we grow biodiverse, organic, circular economies and reduce the role of long distance supply chains, which were imposed on the world by the WTO rules of agriculture, cytosanitary, cytosanitary, phytosanitary measures, intellectual property rights. Most importantly, what we need to do post corona is recognize that the corona infection is not fatal by itself. It becomes fatal if you've had a diet of junk food. So the people with obesity and diabetes in America, the black Americans are the worst victims of the corona infections. The uh, rates jump from 1%, which is the normal rate of mortality to 9.2% with diabetes to 7.6% with cancer. The chronic diseases are a result of a food system. That food system must now be addressed as a disease creating system and we need to shift to health contributing systems. Thank you very much for that excellent statement. Uh, we're going to turn now to our next speaker, Vanessa Ambinotti. The floor is yours, please. Hi, thank you for inviting me to be here with you. Um, so COVID and Brazil. Uh, COVID is spreading right now strongly in Brazil. Uh, the majority of the cases are still on uh, major cities, such as Sao Paulo, Rio de Janeiro, Recife, Fortaleza, and Manaus. And this is the Amazon. So it's not concentrated in just one part of the country, but it's spread. And it's spreading through the countryside too. So this is another major concern. Um, 
the quarantine um, as response to the COVID-19 um, expose the vulnerable people, not just in the urban areas as well as in the rural areas, but the impacts are different. So uh, the ones that were most um, impacted are the population that have lack of housing conditions, uh, a weak or lack access to water, uh, that lost their income or they work at day-by-day -day activities that are not in place anymore. And also the impact of schools that closed where many of the students in the public system would have their meals. So they are not open anymore. Um, the vulnerability is not just for lower income groups, but also for the middle class. Once many of the uh, um, freelancers and um, that provide services um, are not working anymore. So they lost their income and they never had this situation before. Um, the government has answered to this situation through emergency programs of money transfer and um, it, mostly to people that lost their jobs and lost their income. But it's also interesting to observe that the consumer patterns of food changed. Because of the, the quarantine, we were supposed to stay at home. So people are choosing to buy dry food, for example, beans, rice, flour, uh, sugar, salt, and not fresh food. And this is a major, major transformation because who produces fresh fruit, food are the ones that are suffering the most. And here in Brazil, the farmers that are responsible to provide fresh food to the cities are small farmers and family farmers. And they are mainly located close by the cities. So the change on, of these patterns of uh, feeding is impacting them directly. Uh, restaurants are also closed. So again, this, they supply, this small farmers supply restaurants too. And, uh, and also the schools and uh, some public services that supplied um, uh, food to the population. Also the practice of uh, trade and commerce at the local level changed. So people that are able to buy food, they are choosing to buy from stores and supermarkets that deliver the produces at home. So the local markets and fairs or markets, um, farmers markets are not the place where people buy food anymore, not as much as it used to be. So there were farmers that produce a fresh food and they were the ones that had a small tent at the, fair, the market farmers to sell their own products. So they, don't, they lost the con, the, their contact with consumers. And this is major. Um, food supply continues in place. And actually there is a huge a campaign to make people to consume more fresh food because they, they change the way they consume in order to keep, to stay at home. Um, and we, what we see is the impact in the rural areas and the farmers uh, is going to be really different according to who produces what and where is the market of consumption in place. Um, and to, to end this initial talk, I just wanted to make a point that in the last three years, Brazil is going through the dismantling of social programs and cash transfer programs that were focused on fighting uh, inequality and poverty. And COVID-19 arrives at the country uh, in a, where po the population, the low income population and even the middle class is more vulnerable than it was before. So it is even uh, 
improving and not improving, but increasing the precarization process that was already in place. And this is really disturbing. Thank you very much for that uh, sobering outlook. We'll turn next, we'll shift our attention from Brazil to Uganda. Ibrahim, the floor is yours for the next four minutes, please. Uh, hello, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, yes, we started the actual lockdown on uh, March 22nd and uh, things took a turn uh, to some of the unexpected things we've never seen. So Uganda basically is, uh, is a market best food security system because it follows uh, since the 1980s, it's followed uh, the structure adjustment programs. And what that did is that there were more liberalization of, uh, of the economy. Um, hence the lockdown, when it came in place, there were more speculations of actually prices of food being uh, there was skyrocketing and the president was saying you should not be able to raise the prices of food, but he had no control. Uganda does not have a price control or and profiteering laws. So that was really very hard. And this comes into the context that if we have to rethink about the structure of the Ugandan economy, agriculture um, is actually the major uh, the one which employs the majority of the population, actually 70 to 80% of the population, but it's the least funded around like 5.3% of the GDP. And then they blame it to be able to contribute the least among the GDP, which is uh, the 21%, you know, as the contribution. Yet, when we see even the people who are doing much of the food production at the household level, which is like majority of the population, 80% are the women and they are doing subsistence agriculture. So it is even in the former sector, it's not recorded. So to me, I think what COVID-19 has taught us is that actually localization um, is the solution because uh, in the 1990s, we used to have the cooperatives which used to function at the district level. And then from the district level, they would governize food or maybe there were coffee marketing boards or cash crops, then they used to sell to the state. So the farmers had a means or a mechanism of where there was this flow from the state to the farmers at the local level and all that. But right now that is all broken and uh, the government is trying to say that it can be able to feed the people. But the question is how can it be able to go ahead and feed the people right now? Uh, the beans and uh, corn flour, which they are bringing is really not of good quality. So it's bringing all these questions that we cannot be able to answer right now. So what COVID does is that it's explaining or exposing how socially and regionally differentiated um, the Ugandan system was already in, uh, in terms of poverty and inequality and really it's not doing a great job. Though we have flattened the curve and uh, we are having, no one has died in 79, uh, more people have gone home, uh, they've been cured, but the lockdown is really being aggravated and just it's showing how very many things are right now, which is not a good thing that is happening in Uganda. Thank you, Ibrahim. Next, we'll turn to Mustaf Abdirahman, joining us from Somalia. Uh, good evening from the Horn of Africa. I hope you're staying safe. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here with a group of experts uh, in this timely webinar of the impact of COVID-19 on the food security of the global south. Uh, I'm a current AUB food security program student, uh, and I'm doing my thesis uh, under the supervision of uh, Dr. Martinello. Uh, I'm investigating uh, the impact of land use and land cover changes on the livelihoods of agrobastral communities in Beidou, Somalia. Uh, I'm looking at the severity and magnitude of uh, land use and land cover changes using remote sensing of satellite imagery on one hand and 
the drivers and implications and community community strategies on the other hand um somalia is facing crisis of biblical proportions and complex of emergencies uh, that's to say uh, protracted conflict uh, deforestation uh, desert locusts uh, recurrent droughts and more recently the flash floods in northeast somalia in the spotlight of the pandemic and the blake I would like to construct my line of uh, arguments under the banner of uh, food self-sufficiency, localization of food production, and what I call uh, stable food sovereignty. And I want to agree with this to, uh, with Vandana Shiva, uh, who is uh, a very important voice for the food sovereignty concept. Uh, Eckhart Watt said in his last week's webinar speech, and I quote, the inclination to believe the gospel of a trade-based approach to food security is not much developed for some good reasons. And I very much agree with him. Uh, and my take on that, he echoes that localization of food production, at least the stable food of a country is becoming quite significant. And uh, one fact is that Africa is a net food importer, despite the vast agricultural potential. And what I think is very important for the African governments uh, is to focus on reducing uh, their dependency on imports and localize at least uh, their stable feed. Um, it's a paramount importance to learn from the lessons that COVID-19 is teaching us. For those of you who have been following the food ba uh, pandemic Twitter handle, uh, there has been a looming, a looming panic, logistical nightmares, and disruption of the global supply chain, especially Russia and Ukraine, uh, the biggest global uh, wheat suppliers. Uh, there has been measures from those countries to maximize uh, their national food reserve should the lockdown in case uh, prolongs. Uh, but also Vietnam and uh, India, some other uh, exporters of and contributors of uh, the global supply chain, uh, they have also been announcing such measures and there has been a shortage of laborers in the agriculture and manufacturing industries. Uh, what this demands is the question of, can we really rely on such vulnerable supply chain? International trade commentators might entertain the idea of uh, unprecedented move and undisrupted movements of goods and services, but the opposite could be true. Uh, one last thing uh, I wanna talk about is uh, the locust, which is a major problem in the East African region. Uh, and I, as I speak now, the swarms of desert locusts are not only swelling and migrating, but also posing a serious threat to crop production in Somalia, Kenya, Ethiopia, Uganda, and South Sudan. Uh, these countries are already chronically food insecure. Uh, according to FAO's latest report, key locust breeding areas in Yemen, Somalia, and South Sudan face significant risk now and for the coming three months. I would like to conclude that Africa and the rest of the global South need to promote food security through strong domestic production and rethink of sustainability of their food and be prepared for the worst case scenarios in case it happens. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mustaf. We'll now turn for the introductory statement of our final panelist, Rami Zare. Hello, thank you, Rachel. Hello, everyone. Uh, and Dana, good to see you again. I think last time we met was in Terra Madre in 2008. Uh, so uh, I've put on a few uh, white hair. Rachel, uh, I want to say a couple of things, you know, to, to just frame all our discussion. The first thing I want to say is that the COVID-19 pandemic didn't uh, just hit a world in which everything was going well. It hit the world in which 2 billion people went to, 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 to bed hungry every single day. It hit a world in which half the death of the under five can be attributed to malnutrition and these deaths death in Africa alone are in the number in the hundreds of thousands. So this was the world that has been affected by COVID. And what COVID-19 has done is that it has exacerbated existing uh, fault lines. It appears in food more than in other areas because of 
the organic importance of food in everyone's life, but also because food security, the concept, the notion impinges on so many different dimensions. It impinges on international trade, on local agricultural production. It impinges on our on poverty, on, on, uh, on, on unemployment, also on diets, uh, on the access to sanitation, and so on and so forth. So food probably is the best lens through which one can observe the impact of the pandemic on a world that was already shaky. Now, uh, the, 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 what it has done, of course, it has, it has deepened the existing fault lines into what we term generally the food system. It has done that in everywhere on the planet, but it has done that much more in the South because this is where those fault lines were the deepest. They were deepest because of historical reasons, because of a colonial legacy, because of uh, imperial structures, because of local, national, political power plays. <clears throat> this is not the moment to, to address them fully and completely, but they certainly were deeper. And the second issue that I want to bring to people's attention <clears throat> is that uh, the pandemic is not the great equalizer uh, the, the way it's usually being promoted. It doesn't affect rich and poor equally. It doesn't affect all countries in the world equally. This is the data just doesn't <clears throat> show that to be true. The poor die more than the rich. And not only because they have better access to healthcare, but also <clears throat> because, as Vandana put it, their original state, because of diets, uh, because of access to poor quality food, and because of labor and the use of their own bodies in producing their own food, all of this prepares them to die, to be vulnerable to COVID-19. <clears throat> now, the issue that I want to raise finally to conclude this brief uh, aperçu is that <clears throat> we all know today and everybody is calling for a major reform of the food system. Everybody is calling for a food system in which food is a right and food contributes to a better environment and food contributes to better health. But <clears throat> what surprises me and what strikes me, I'm sorry, I need to get some water here. What strikes me is that people on all sides of the divide are calling for that. Starting with the World Bank, all the way to the food sovereignty movement, passing by the corporations that sell food. Everybody today seems to be carrying this big flag and, and wants to change the food system. These calls are important. The question remains, does anyone have a plan for that? If we do, then let's discuss it. And this is the place to start talking about it. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Rami. With those really provocative and wide-ranging statements from a variety of perspectives and geographies. I hand back over to Martin. We have some questions. Thank you very much. I would like to first hand over to Michael Segawa, who also joined us from Uganda. Michael, you have a question, I believe, for uh, Dr. Shiva. So please go ahead. Oh, sometimes the internet is not easy. Um, if not, if you're still struggling, we can also ask, uh, allow you to talk later. We also have John Russell, who joins us from here. John, you have a question for Dr. Shiva as well. Uh, yes, can you, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, so my question was, uh, well, from Arundhati Roy's recent uh, Financial Times article, she finished by saying that this is an opportunity to uh, rethink the doomsday machine that we have built for ourselves. And I think that this applies to the monoculture based and unhealthy and inequitable food system that you and uh, all of the other panelists were talking about. But uh, I was wondering what agency and uh, to what extent do you think that we'll be able to see a paradigm shift in this food system from this pandemic? And what agency do farmers like the ones who uh, spoke of in your introductory statement, the cash crop farmers, the ones who lost their livelihoods, 
what agency do they have and what are the political uh, implications for a transition away from that model culture system to the circular economy, food sovereignty based biodiverse system that you were speaking of? Um, so, you know, agency is given to us because we are alive. Uh, we uh, are creative, we are part of the earth. And it's only for the last few decades that India has been driven literally to a dependence on, on cash crops. You know, the World Bank said we shouldn't be growing food for ourselves. We should be growing potatoes, onions, and tomatoes. It was called the pot strategy. Um, and that's what's collapsed. Uh, we work with farmers. Pro uh, by now, I think we've trained millions of farmers. Uh, the first is have your own seed because the worst illusion was corporate seeds are better. They are not. They're empty in nutrition, they are married to chemicals, and they're a big part of the problem. But most suicides are because of costly seeds. Second, you don't need external inputs. Ecological systems, the soil, it's soil food web. We train farmers on how the soil is living and how through composting and regeneration and biodiversity, we can grow more food. And all our data is showing there's more production. We have to, of course, change the indicator. Yield as a reductionist measure, which is a product of monocultures, hid so much, didn't tell you anything, didn't tell you about nutrition, didn't tell you about its impact on the soil, didn't tell you about the status of the farmers. Our farmers are earning 10 times more than the cash crop chasing farmers. And we can grow two times India's food needs. Of course, it's not the case that people alone have agency in this context. People who brought us to this crisis, as Rami said, we entered, Corona entered a world which was already in crisis with chronic diseases, with hunger, with unemployment. And now it's just been accelerated. Those who are planning also, and they think because they're trillionaires, they have agency, more agency than the rest of us. Uh, we're planning a world of farming without farmers. The digital agriculture, I've done a report on Ag One, Bill Gates had one, you can go to Navdanya International website and read it. Um, or the idea that food doesn't have to be food. We can constitute ingredients in the lab. These crises actually they're saying, oh, you didn't realize that it's the work of the farmer on a small farm that is A, giving you 80% of the food today, that is FAO data, second, that it's that food which has the full nutrients, the full spectrum of nutrients that enable our gut microbiome to be nourished. Most chronic diseases are related to the destruction of the gut microbiome. Mm. And our gut microbiome needs diversity of diet. That is why in systems like Indian systems, we are told to eat diversity. That's why the Mediterranean diet is a diet of diversity and was discovered to be a healthy diet because suddenly the world realized you can't reconstitute the same ingredient and make it look different. The second lesson that's not being learned is that the, the corona crisis goes hand in hand with the hunger and food crisis, but most significantly half of humanity has lost its livelihoods. So if we don't create work for people, and the only place where you can get adequate work is through growing good food, we can shift from the 80% supply from small farms to 100% supply from small farm by creating the local circular economies. Or we can say, we don't need these 99% they're disposable people. That is the human question. Today, we stand at a watershed. It's not just about food. It's about, will people be involved in the food system? Will everyone have a right to food that's being worthy of being called food? Or will it be anti-food? Anti, they're looking for antibodies right now to the corona. But you know, they've turned food into anti-food, which destroys our health rather than nourishing us. Go to any indigenous language, go to the language in Uganda, go to the language in Somalia, and you will find the meaning of food, that which nourishes the earth and nourishes us. When it destroys the earth and destroys our health, it stopped being food. So these are big debates and we'll have to move out of the mechanistic paradigm that the world is a machine. We'll have to move out of the monoculture of the mind. 
that biodiversity can be destroyed without cost. And we will have to move out of money making as the main objective of an economy rather than nourishing the earth, nourishing people and giving work to all hands. My work, and this is my dedication for the next 10 years. India with no hunger, India with no debt and no suicides, India with no hands being wasted, no minds being empty, no hearts drained of compassion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dakui. Now we have Michael Segawa from Uganda. Please, Michael, go ahead. The floor is yours. Yes, hello everyone. Um, as you well know that uh, most of uh, the African economies uh, uh, heavily depend on uh, agriculture as Bahati just uh, mentioned earlier on. So I was just wondering if agriculture um, will cushion us as Africa. You did you ask me that? Again, it's the impact. Michael, did you ask no. me that question? Yeah, yes, I'm asking you that. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I sometimes smile in my heart and say this is a moment where the, we, the more backward we are, the better off we are. You know, subsistence agriculture, growing food for yourself was made to look bad. Today, those are the people who have food. Not having been locked in to global supply chains, dependency, those are the people who will be able to make a transition to the future. And we'll have to start revisiting the economic paradigm of industrial globalized farming, the scientific paradigm of external input systems where everything comes from outside. No, agroecology is an internal input system. We are internal input systems. And at this point, where the driver for the next step of the new economy, for those who want to make money, at the next level, where they're talking about big data, big data mined from farmers, big data mined from the soil, big data mined from our bodies as the new oil, that system will ultimately lead to even knowledge being an external input. So we have to become internal input self-organized system. There's a very beautiful scientific term for this that has come from scientists in Chile um, called Maturana. And basically it is autopoiesis. Freedom to have agency, freedom to make choices, freedom to evolve, freedom to work with the earth. That is a self-organized act. And we are at a watershed where the old paradigm is with a lot of inertia is hanging in there and the emergence of what is both a new paradigm but also an ancient paradigm. Anything ancient that has lasted long went through the test of sustainability. Ancient cultures taught us how to live in harmony and peace with the earth. They taught us how to grow more food with a very small footprint. They taught us how to grow nutritious food and nutritionally dense food. And they taught us how to evolve biodiversity of crops and seeds. Those are the lessons that contemporary science is teaching us that biodiversity is health. My work in Navdanya has shown biodiversity produces more. We know biodiversity is the best pest control and disease control system. And we will soon be coming to the World Biodiversity Day on 22nd of May. These are the moments for waking up and not walk, sleepwalk into what will not just be extinction of species, but if we take the IPCC seriously, if we take the Biodiversity Convention and the IPBES seriously, we are looking, if we continue on that old path of mechanistic, chemical, reductionist, globalized supply chain system with monocultures, we are looking at 100 years more for humanity on this planet. Then we'll be extinct. And these are IPCC reports saying we've got a decade for transition. That decade of transition must be used to put food, livelihoods, health at the center of the food economy. Thank you very much. Uh, we have another question here from Professor Issam Bashur, uh, who's one of our very own uh, uh, agricultural icons here in the Middle East. Um, he, his question is, 
uh, to ask the speakers, what are the countries actually doing to help? Are there any uh, support systems in place at the moment? Perhaps I'll ask this question first to uh, Dr. Zareg, who can enlighten us on the Arab world. Yes. So the question is, what are countries doing now to help? Yes, to help their citizens. Well, they're engaging. I mean, countries are responding in very conventional ways. Most of the response so far, as we've tracked it, has been at two levels. Uh, one of them is at the level of uh, procuring more food through either uh, supporting trade or through improving, uh, uh, improving the, the, the local production. And uh, the next one has been to improve access to food, most commonly through this, the distribution of, uh, of uh, money in very few cases, failed distribution as in this country, uh, where it hasn't, it's been talked about, but hasn't been implemented, or distribution of uh, just food in, in, in packages, which is fraught with its own problems because the choices of the food that you distribute makes a lot of difference to the diet that uh, people will adopt. There has been very little talk about enhancing the stability of our systems when it comes to confronting issues such as this one. There has been very little uh, talk about uh, truly putting in value the people who produce the food on this planet, which who are the smaller producer. We're looking at this as, as a, in a very mechanistic way, in a very engineering problem of getting food from point A to point B without very much paying attention to the implications that this has on people and on resources. Uh, this is essentially for most of the regimes uh, uh, a political issue in order to keep people quiet and, and, uh, and avoid further um, uh, uh, riots and, uh, that we're starting to see everywhere, starting with Lebanon, ending with South Africa uh, and uh, in most of the countries of the South. This is essentially what's happening at this level. Thank you very much. We have uh, Nate Ferguson, who would like to ask a question. Nate, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, everybody, for speaking. There's uh, quite a few um, quotes that I've been furiously writing down because I need to remember them. Um, I, I'm, uh, I'm, 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 I'm particularly struck by uh, Dr. Rami Zareg's um, statement that everybody is calling for change. It's, uh, you know, forgive me for saying this, but it, it, it can make, you know, cynics out of all of us. Um, and what I'm particularly interested in, um, and also driven by uh, kind of the, um, the, 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 the vivid vision that Dr. Shiva has shown us of, of what a different world can look like as far as food is concerned. Um, but one of the peculiarities of the current situation is, uh, and not the situation, but the current food system, is that we talk about... Um, you know, investors and people with capital, uh, they see the world as, as um, uh, different, different sections of, of, of the value chain have, have a certain value added. And, and the irony is that somebody who, who turns seeds into, you know, lush green fields of, of food that people can eat um, have very little value added compared to the people who can um, put that food in shrink wrap uh, and, and ship it across the world. Um, and that's obviously um, a problem on many dimensions. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm having a hard time getting to getting to the crux of my question. But given that um, very often, very uh, uh, nuanced and powerful anti-globalization movements um, in the world have, have kind of materialized in uh, protectionism or other I would say simplistic answers to um, to these questions that don't actually put the agency in the hands of of uh, uh, producers and consumers. So my question is how how do we solve the problem that uh, the this this kind of this kind of um, sustainable food production that results in um, that, that also plays an important environmental role? How does that become uh, something? How, how do we solve problems of, of, of these people always falling into debt? Um, how, do we, how do we make this not just uh, ecologically sustainable, but uh, financially sustainable? Thank you. 
Thank you, Michael. Who's this question directed to you? I mean, it's a very good uh, question. Really, really anybody. Send so let me us. come in before I leave, uh, yeah, Marjorie. Yeah? Um, so, as I mentioned, ecological systems are internal input systems. Yeah. The so if you give organic matter to the soil, the soil creates microbes that give you the soil fertility and produce stronger plants, more nutritious plants with far more energy density. So at every level, there is more nutrition per acre. It requires absolutely no borrowing. So uh, ecological agriculture is a debt-free agriculture. Ecological agriculture works to enrich the soils. Uh, you know, the carbon nitrogen in our soils has increased 100%. Microbes have increased 60%. Our water level has come up 70 feet and the pollinators are six times more than in the forest next door. That work is work for an ecological service, but we are also getting more nutrition per acre. And there is no debt for the farmer who's practicing it. These are now, you know, none, I wasn't supposed to exist. I did a study on the Green Revolution 84 when Bhopal erupted and Punjab erupted in violence. And I said, why are we doing agriculture like this? I, was, I had studied quantum theory. So I did a book on the violence of the Green Revolution. We built movements in India. We've built global movements. Today, 35 years later, the FAO recognizes agroecology is the way forward. The International Assessment of Science and Technology for Development, which is like the IPCC for agriculture, says business as usual is not the option. And when you talked about being a cynic, yes, at the level of everyone saying we must have a new food system, all voices are saying it. But some are saying it in the old paradigm of mechanistic external input monoculture systems and food is just tough. It doesn't matter how it nourishes our body. And the other system is recognizing biodiversity matters, the soil matters, the way you grow your food matters and that everyone has a right to real food and healthy food. So the paradigms are different. The call for newness sounds the same, but it's for different things. We are, as I said earlier, at a watershed and it's food where we'll decide this shift. Food is so important. And I think one thing that the uh, um, lockdown has done, I have so many people ringing me up and saying, the lockdown has taught me how important it is to eat right. I'm now being thoughtful about what I eat rather than just picking up the fast food that was closest to me. The lockdown has made people wake up to the value of good eating. And it has made them wake up to the essentials of life. Now it is our work to create the linkages between the growers of food and the eaters of food. In societies where they were not disrupted, we have to strengthen them. In other places, CSAs, farmers markets will have to be brought back. And I think one of the work we have to do is just because during the Corona epidemic period, certain actions were taken. And I refer to this particularly because of what Vanessa said of how people are not buying fresh food. You know, you were the country where in um, Lula's time, the zero hunger slogan came. Links between farmers and agroecology and local food systems were created. Well, the post corona period cannot be living in the emergency of the corona period. We have to unleash our best imagination. And with that imagination, we'll have to go political energy of solidarity. Solidarity between those who grow the food those who eat the food, local institutions, because that is where the shift is coming and will come. And most importantly, a paradigm shift of the kind that is being made when you all get together. So towards a new paradigm with ancient roots, so we can all have good food and all farmers can be more secure, both in their dignity, their livelihood and their finance. The best to all of you, thank you. Thank you so much, Vandana, for finding time to speak to us. So, um, you know, we're, we're very grateful for your input 
very powerful words. I think uh, everyone will go away with uh, highly inspired by what by what you said. So thank you and best regards to uh, you know yourself and your community in India. And please stay safe and healthy. We need you for way longer than the next ten years. We need and the same you. greetings to all of you. Thank you. Thank bye you bye. so much. Thank bye you. Bye. Bye bye. I have uh, a next question here, which from uh, Fatima Yafufi, who uh, asked a very important question. Uh, and I would like to direct this to everyone because she asks the question, what is actually happening to those agricultural laborers uh, who are currently not employed and who cannot work, those daily laborers? So may I direct this question first to Vanessa Empinotti to tell us how is the situation of agricultural laborers in Brazil? So like, like we are saying, uh, it's different depending on the place. Um, right now, daily laborers, they, they usually they work more for a larger farmer, larger farming and to produce uh, commodities for to export, um, and uh, and mostly for fruits, for the, not for cereals. Uh, um, so um, they, this group, a specific group, it's still working. Um, because the production is, is still in place. They were not the main affected ones right now. The main affected ones were the ones uh, that own their own land and they are family farmers. And, uh, and for these ones, they usually hire maybe one or two people in their properties. Um, and uh, I'm, I don't know for sure uh, if they lost their income, this uh, uh, daily labors or not. But what we know is that many of these family farmers, they are losing their production because they are not able to sell it. And, um, and they, they can survive for a really short period of time. And this is, I think it's a major concern because um, many of the small farmers, they are, they produce a, in the system of agroecology and they are much more vulnerable right now than the other ones that produce in, in, for cash crop and for exports right now. I'm not saying, I don't know, it's gonna change in the next month. It's gonna change in three months. Uh, the impacts on farming is gonna be different in different periods, in different moments, depending on who consumes these products and the, the, cons the commercialization system in place. So um, uh, the daily laborers, they, definitely are more vulnerable to, and they are the first one to be cut when we need to uh, control expenses and, and, uh, and, heavy, uh, and don't have the possibility to uh, sell the production. But, uh, but the property, the owners of land, the family farmers and small farmers are also in major in a situation of major danger. Thank you so much, Vanessa. Let me uh, ask also this question also to Ibrahim Bahati. How's the situation in Uganda in relation to agricultural workers? Um, all right, so the situation in Uganda is, uh, it depends on where you are. If you're living in a rural area, it's uh, the lockdown has not really affected people that much because you still have um, easy mobility to move from your homestead to the garden or you have the ability to go ahead and still work for other people and get some food or get a daily income although they are saying that you should be able to stay at home so um, people still find ways to go out and find sources of food 
for instance. But when you just go in urban areas, that is where it is being a major problem because almost you find that, let's say Kampala city alone is a city of almost 5 million. You have almost 1 million commuting every other day to go into a city to look for a certain particular livelihood or maybe if they've gotten to go and work for for food in terms of the produce they are getting from the I mean from from the farm and selling it so it becomes very very tricky and as we are seeing mostly um, the food distribution uh, that's how they're saying that the government is able to go ahead and distribute food but it's very many p i mean very few people have access to it and even that which is being distributed is not as nutri as nutritious as we could be able to say that so depending on where you are mostly it's in the urban areas that we are seeing so much uh, so much aggravation of livelihoods of where most people cannot be able to do anything because they are stuck in homes they cannot be able to go anywhere no transport uh, systems that are working, the health facilities are also not, so everything is just on a lockdown and that is where it is very, very worse. Thank you so much, uh, Ibrahim. Uh, Dr. Zadek, what is your take on, uh, especially- Thank you, Thank you Martin. What? I was hoping you'd ask me because this is an issue that is very close to my heart. I think one needs to uh, look at uh, two different uh, parts of the world, uh, in the north and in the south. Let me say a couple of words about the north because it's important uh, in a sense. The, the agricultural labor in most countries in the north, and I'm thinking now the UK, and I'm thinking France, I'm thinking Spain, I'm thinking the United States, depends on migrant laborers who come from the poorer countries of the south. This is why they're connected. And uh, those people migrate. This is the period when they start moving to go and do the harvests and do the planting of the next seasons in the countries of the North. The lockdown has negatively impacted them. The North is looking at it as something that is uh, disturbing its own value chains, its own supply chains. But the South is looking at it as remittances that are not going to be made, which are going to impact negatively the, the ability of people to access food, to purchase food, the income of those laborers who were migrants into the, the North. So that is something that's really important that brings together North and South around the issue of migrant agricultural labor. On the other hand, and in certain value chains, and I'm thinking here about the meat packing and the meat value chain in the US, for instance, not, uh, not exclusively, the workers are being considered as frontline workers. It's a strange thing that all those people who are always despised and looked down at has suddenly have suddenly become the heroes of the pandemic world. So everybody wants to hail them and tell them the same way as we're doing with nurses whom we never paid as they were, they, they needed to be paid. And we're doing the same thing all the world. We're not, huh? The, 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 the government uh, are doing that with the food workers. Now the food workers are being asked to work, but like everywhere else, frontline workers who are the weakest link in the usual days, the strongest link in those days here, these food workers are working without any safety measures. They're being asked to go to work in the same way as the nurses are, without any of the protective equipment, without any of the, the or with very little, insufficient. And this is something that's been coming up a lot. In the South, things are different. And I think uh, Ibrahim has put it very well, is that people are able to go to work because they've been considered as frontline worker. In Lebanon, for example, the, the agricultural work has been exempted from the lockdown. And I think the same thing has been happening uh, everywhere else. We have the workers. This is why they're able to work and to produce in our countries. The North imports those workers. It does not want to import them anymore. And then it's going to find a problem to have a problem in actually harvesting its own food. Thank you. Thank you very much.
I have a question to uh, Mustafa Abdi Rahman. Um, Mustafa, you heard, we hear disturbing news from uh, Somalia at the moment because of the locust crisis. Um, how do you see this interaction between locust and uh, COVID-19 developing in Somalia? Mustaf, can you hear us? Well, I have to unmute you. You have to unmute yourself, I think. Yeah, sorry. Uh, you hear me now? Yes. Yes, unfortunately, Somalia has not seen such a locust outbreak in 25 years. And it is one of the first hard hit countries uh, compared to the neighboring countries like Kenya and uh, Uganda. And the la it's a large scale invasion as big as cities, and it has destroyed thousands of acres of land uh, and posed a major threat to food security and uh, rural livelihoods to tens of millions of people. Um, a single locust can destroy um, about 170,000 tons of grain, uh, enough to feed one billion people a year. So. The problem is here in Somalia, and one of the things that we are suffering from is uh, our uh, poor preparation and how our government is so weak uh, to fight uh, uh, the locust uh, amid the pandemic. Uh, Kenya has been better than us, Uganda, but also Uganda was better than us because they have been following uh, the movement and the migration of the locusts. Uh, from Somalia all the way through their countries and they have prepared uh, for what has been coming uh, to their way. Uh, and these climate scientists believe that uh, climate change is to blame uh, because of uh, large scale cyclones that uh, has erupted in uh, the Arabian Peninsula uh, and uh, some other small scale uh, uh, cyclones in the northeastern Somali coastal towns uh, like uh, Cyclone Adai, Cyclone Luan, and Cyclone Bawar. Those uh, cyclones have uh, uh, caused torrential rains to, 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 to happen in the area, thus uh, gave uh, a favorable condition to the locusts to breed uh, in the area. And it's millions, it's millions, and it's replicating the eggs of those uh, uh, locusts are there. Uh, and food security wise, in East Africa, around 20 million people have been affected. Uh, those who have been already uh, feeling uh, food insecurity. In addition to the cumulative effects and the, the, the domino effects of, uh, of uh, the pandemic, uh, the World Food Programme is warning that the number, this number could be more than, more than double to 43 million in three months. So desert locusts are highly mobile, migrating up to 150 kilometers a day with the wind, capable of stripping largest widths of uh, vegetated areas. So this is a major problem and it is resulting. This is uh, the issue now. It's coming back to, uh, to its way to Somalia. Uh, and the time is horrible. Uh, this is the main planting season. It's uh, the good season. We call it good here. Uh, and the rainy season has just started. So we are not prepared. FAO is doing some uh, uh, quite a good job in countries like Kenya and Uganda. But uh, Somalia uh, is not much prepared for what's coming. Thank you so much, Mustaf. And I have uh, another question for uh, Vanessa. Vanessa, there's uh, this uh, irony, or not irony, but the, the fact that Brazil is one of the key food exporters in the world. How do you expect COVID-19 and the ongoing crisis to affect food uh, exports from Brazil, not just to the global north, but also to the global south? Well, this is not my area of expertise, so international trade. So what I'm gonna say is coming from my own perspective. And I will be careful not to uh, expose myself to assumptions that I don't know very well. 
But I think that what we need to, I need to make clear is that Brazil um, is able to, the production of food in Brazil, uh, it's divided in roughly in two. Uh, the supply of the internal uh, market uh, for food, it's, um, is the responsibility of small farmers and family farmers. They are the ones that supply the Brazilian um, consumption of food, mainly, mainly. And then there is the exporters farmers or cash crop, but exporter farmers that produce for exports. And the majority of their production is for exports. So two groups, and even in the past, in the government, there were two ministries that would deal with these different groups. Right now, it's not like that anymore. There were policies and programs uh, oriented to the different groups. And, uh, and the ones that were responsible and are responsible to supply the regional and internal markets are the farmers that are more vulnerable. They, they have smaller areas, but also uh, some of them are, were moving from a poverty condition to an increase in its life condition in the last uh, 15 years, but it changed a lot in the last two years. So when it, we talk about uh, the, the potential to export, what we see until now is that um, um, there was not major, there were not major changes. So, for example, uh, the production of soybean that was harvested this year was already traded. So, because this is how the area, the business work. Um, and um, what we need to check is that if the conditions for the, the next plantation period is gonna, is gonna be the same. And what, what do I mean by that? Um, export, uh, food producers for exports, they are heavily dependent on inputs. And these inputs, uh, most of them are produced outside of Brazil. So there is a huge dependence on inputs to maintain uh, the production of commodities. So this is a major point. Another major point is trading and traders. Traders are the middlemen, the ones that buy and sell the production to and that creates this network, international network for a commodities distribution. And on the other hand, they also are input providers for farmers. So it's going to depend how traders are going to be able to, um, to compromise in buying the production ahead as they used to do, and how much they will be able to uh, um, support the inputs. Also, the price of these inputs is going to be a major issue. How much the cost of production is going to change. So, and then we are related to oil prices. So the dimension, it's much bigger. Uh, and the variables in, involved to say if Brazil is going to be able to continue to export are much more complex too. On the other hand, um, we also need to check and see how the importers, the country that import the food, uh, the commodities, how is going to be their behavior. So from right now, uh, we didn't see change. So China is still uh, committed to buy the Brazilian soybean, uh, pork, uh, it's uh, beef, uh, meat from pork. It's also a major market with China. So not, things didn't change yet. But there is um, a situation that is uh, uncomfortable related to how the Brazilian government is going to be able to answer to the COVID-19 
and how the Brazilian government is able to um, to uh, promote programs and control the spread of the disease and uh, the virus, and also um, how the Brazilian government is going to be able to recuperate the economy, the national economy. So it brings some instability. And right now the Brazilian government is sending signs that are not leading to a more um, secure and structured answer to COVID. On top of that, we have a minister from the actual government uh, make uh, statements that are really um, critical and um, aggressive towards China. So this kind of international relations is also influencing how the responses from China and from other countries towards the Brazil, Brazil and the Brazilian economy and the Brazilian products. So. Uh, the interaction between China and the United States and how they are going to trade is going to impact Brazil. And we will need to see how what's going to happen um, later on. And um, finally, uh, uh, the other factors that we need to consider is how Brazil is going to uh, react and to COVID-19 in relation to infrastructure, the system of transportation mainly is, uh, the transportation is by trucks. So we deal with people that are the drivers and, uh, and how the ports are working. So this is something that we, we don't know what's gonna happen in the future. There are uh, uh, vulnerabilities there. And also our regional, um, partners such as Argentina. Argentina decided not to discuss any uh, questions at the Mercosul at this year because of COVID-19. And there is a, a concern from our the Brazilian country's neighbors about how Brazil has been able to control the spread of the virus and how it's uh, impacting the other countries, even in the spread of the virus. So these are all new variables that were not in place before. And we'll need to see how it's going to work. Um, so I don't know. I don't know if Brazil is gonna be able to maintain as one of the major uh, food exporters and commodity exporters. It's going to depend a lot from external variables and also the political response to COVID-19. But right now, the uh, farmers that work for the export area, uh, because of the nature of the product, the, the nature of the market, uh, now they didn't, um, they didn't suffer the consequence but they will, and they are much more dependent on variables that they cannot control than if we compare to small scale farming and family farmers. On the other hand, family farmers and small scale farming is suffering right now. Thank you very much, uh, Vanessa. Uh, I have another question from Rania Tuma, who has uh, asks, do you think that digital agriculture could help to counteract the COVID impact on agriculture and food security, especially in the global south? I know that Dr. Zarek has done a study on uh, digital agriculture. Perhaps he can go ahead first. Uh, thank you, uh, Martin. Digital agriculture is a wide array of uh, tools, and I insist on the word tool. It is not a panacea. This is not what's going to change agriculture. It is people who will change agriculture. It is people who will change food security in the way we consume, in the way we produce, in the way we work for a fair and just food system. Digital tools can be used for nefarious uh, 
means and they can be used for the best of possible means. We are currently, as I speak, right in the middle of the use of digital tools for uh, discussing and debating the future of agriculture and the food security in the region. And I see this as an extremely positive input to be able to bring Vandana Shiva and bring uh, uh, Vanessa and, 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 and Ibrahim and Mustaf all the way from the four corners of the earth into one place, trying to map future action to change the way things are being done. So that's one very positive aspect. Now, if we're going to use digital tools in order to create a world where there are no farmers and without planning very well the exit of people from farming, i.e. by creating scores and masses and droves of people who are unemployed and who go hungry, then of course that particular digital tool is not what is required. But believe me and trust me and look at history, humans have, and have never needed the digital tool to uh, mess up uh, systems that could otherwise uh, be based on community and on solidarity. Thank you so much, Rami. Um, I have a final question for everyone. Um, as we found out today, we, we, we can see that COVID-19 has in fact what it did, it has exposed the fragility uh, in our current agri-food system and the vulnerability of those living in poverty and with uncertain livelihoods. What do you think from all your perspectives, what steps should be taken to reduce the fragility and vulnerability going forward? And what trade-offs should we be prepared to accept for these objectives? So perhaps I start with Mustaf in Somalia. What do you think? Uh, how could we reduce uh, fragility in rural livelihoods? Uh, to answer that question, uh, we have to look at the problems uh, and the fragilities themselves. Uh, let's say we have the locust problem here in Somalia and then COVID-19 and then some other uh, uh, underlying problems. Uh, for COVID-19 and food security, uh, the Somali government has recently announced, uh, especially the Ministry of Finance, 100% uh, waiver of taxes on rice and dates and 50% in oil and flour for three months. And I wanna thank for the government and applaud for that uh, effort it has made. For the locusts, uh, other East African governments, with the help of uh, international partners like FAO, are doing quite well. In Kenya for, and Uganda, for example, uh, uh, there has been a preparation for the locusts uh, as they were wreaking havoc in, in across Somalia. Um, they have employed pesticides, fuel, uh, vehicles, sprayers, uh, especially uh, precision sprayers and uh, surveillance uh, of the locusts using drones, even though environmental safety of uh, the pesticides and other uh, tools that have been used, uh, there has been a concern. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, Somalia was the first hit country uh, in the Horn of Africa, and that didn't give much time to prepare. However, one thing that I can mention is that affected communities uh, employed ineffective methods such as using live bullets uh, to disperse the locusts. Uh, some others used to smoke because uh, there has not been uh, some effective methods. For COVID-19, things are quite horrible. Somalia's capability to prevent, uh, detect and respond to any global health security threat has scored six out of 100 as measured by Health Emergency Preparedness Index in 2016. Since then, the country has not been doing better. Nevertheless, humanitarian partners and the Somali government has been raising awareness uh, on the prevention of uh, the possible spread of the virus throughout uh, the population. Uh, they are more concerned about the possible impacts of the virus on the livelihoods of uh, the vulnerable population in Somalia, including internally displaced persons that are around 2.6 million uh, uh, in the country. And food insecure households and communities and people living with the locusts uh, and flood prone areas. 
for the very recent floods and possible flash floods in the coming season, FAO Swalim uh, has warned communities in the riverine areas uh, and the coastal towns uh, to be uh, to be uh, to 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 be alert. And people are very vulnerable, but what Somalis can always count on is the community spirit and solidarity for their affected brothers. There has not been durable solutions so far for the recurrent droughts, flash floods, uh, and other uh, complex of emergencies in the country. But uh, we are trying our best to contain the COVID-19 that is spreading throughout the cities now. Uh, the rural areas and the countryside is quite safe. Uh, and I think, uh, I believe that African government has have to wake up. This could this come, uh, has to be a wake up call for the African government. Back in the days before uh, coronavirus, our leaders used to go to abroad when they have problems, health problems especially. Now there's nowhere to go. And this has to be a wake up call for them. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Mustaf. Um, I would also like to ask this question to Ibrahim. Um, thank you so much. Um, so what I would love to begin with is that mostly within Uganda's case, though we have tried to maybe flatten the curve of the COVID-19, but I think we need to start looking um, at how Uganda is handling this in a way that also brings out some of the fragilities that were already existence in the uh, existent in the first place, uh, mostly in terms of poverty and uh, inequality. And of course, there's more talk about right now how COVID is just going to be impacting on uh, or is going to raise uh, mostly youth unemployment. So as we know right now, there is more than 50% uh, increase of the population that is living in urban areas. And it's just most of that, that you find almost like 51% would not have, uh, I mean, like a lack of access to clean water and uh, like around 82% do not have even improved uh, sanitation facilities. So that creates a vacuum that actually when you're living in uh, uh, towns as more romanticized that this is just going to be able to, you know, have improved livelihood and all that is actually not the situation. We've actually been having cases of people who are caught in towns and then there are other hearsays of having people having to walk to um, almost two weeks from Kampala to, you know, to their home villages because they say, what next now? I think you have to choose between a lockdown, which is going to create hunger and the disease, which one is going to kill you fast? And people are saying, I think it should not be the other way. So um, the other case, which you, um, I think we should, we need to focus more on is about uh, the COVID-19 has really, brought up the true nature of countries, mostly the global north, because when you're faced with a pandemic, you have to first help yourself. So it's, it's right now each country for its own self. And this is bringing in the factor that uh, the global south, mostly countries like Uganda need to be more self-sustainable most of times in terms of uh, uh, whether it's agriculture products or the production for the market so that they can uh, be able to contain and uh, feed uh, their economies, which has not really been the case. Because when you see most of the times um, the people who are well enough to do, you find that that is like 5% of the population, let's say in Uganda, uh, who are benefiting and they are the ones who are engaged in large uh, large-scale cash crop production and they are subsidized by the government, yet when you have around this 80% of the total population that is agriculture dependent, that actually lives on subsistence agriculture, and it's not being provided any extension services, or even if they are provided, they are not well-to-do in terms of uh, access, in terms of how people can be able to um, 
uh, into how they are regionally distributed, that creates a concern that we need to look and go far uh, into supporting the existing family farmers so they can be very uh, self-sustained because they are the ones who are prominent mostly within the Ugandan society. And as Uganda is the food basket, we'll not be able to have these major problems like as they were if we were having the revival of the, corpora, of the cooperatives being able to deal with the local food systems rather than just putting it in the hands of uh, the few rich people. Oh. in the society to just go ahead and do that for us. I think that what I would love to say uh, is, uh, is about, is about the, the, the language which we are using right now in the discussion of, uh, of Corona and how it's been affected us. So you have mostly the majority of the people who are migrant workers who are going to the Middle East or these GCC countries to work there now are returning home and there is that kind of stigma of which they are called these are imported cases or the returnees and uh, there is that essentialized stigma of which the government itself had a hand in it so we need to look into the systems that are more sustainable that actually support the local people that look towards uh, alleviating poverty and giving access to some of the major services but as well not trying to say that everything should just go into the hands of the few rich people in the society which are subsidized by the government which in the end of the day they are not solving anything the money is just going outside and uh, it's not returning to the ugandan economy what we're returning actually i mean retaining is very little and cannot be able to help us in a case like this when this pandemic just broke up thank you thank you so much and the same question i it yeah, goes to uh Vanessa and Pinotti, how can we reduce fragility and vulnerability in our uh, food systems? I think what COVID-19 is showing us is that we cannot, again, we cannot think about food security and food production alone, or just looking at the rural areas. Uh, when we see the impact of the spread of the virus uh, right now, uh, the most vulnerable uh, groups are in urban settings. Because in urban settings, people depend on everything from outside. They don't produce their own, own food. They need to have access to water. They need to have access to housing. So uh, the dependence is huge. Um, and the concentration of the population in the developing countries or the global south in urban areas is a consequence of the development model that we have in place. So uh, what we see through the COVID-19 is that uh, people are rethinking about what is the advantage of living in a city. And the, the consequence of living in a city throughout a pandemic that is gonna change the way that we relate to people, that we relate to food, that we relate and we move around. Um, and many, and some of these people uh, will be moving to the countryside. And, uh, but right now, uh, because of the concentration of the urban, of the population in urban areas, the whole food production system is oriented towards these urban areas. And there is this huge uh, issue that the COVID-19 also brought, brings to us is that the commercial practices or the system of commercialization. So where is the, the food produced, how far it is, and not just that and how it is produced, of course, but how is distributed? How does the system of distribution works? It's becoming clear how necessary is to bring closer the producer and the consumer. But how do you do that in a city like Sao Paulo with 50 million people? And how far you need to go in order to be able to supply this amount of population with food. 
So it's not just a matter of how much food we are able to produce, but how to distribute. And are we able to change things without promoting structural changes? And even changes that, re that will change the relation between urban and rural areas. Uh, on the other hand, also maybe we'll see a move leaving the city and going to the countryside and looking for land to live in the countryside and not necessarily to produce food. So we have, we'll have another variable, another flow, a new flow that will reshape the rural areas and the uses of rural areas beyond food production. And what does it mean? So on one hand, you, you, you'll be able to have consumers and producers closer and create new systems of distribution of food. But on the other hand, what is the pressure over land, farming land? So this, I, I think that we'll have new uh, questions that we raise from the situation that we live today. And that pushes us to think about food security and food production beyond rural and agriculture. And of course that rural and agriculture is still important. The way that we produce, how we work with nature and know against nature. So Vandana Shiva brings this reading to it. The dependence on inputs and the model that prevails over food production and the alternatives that we have, that even though we think on a different way of production, food, producing food, we also need to think in a different way to relate to consumers and to, re and to relate to the urban areas. And the urban areas need to change too. So this is, to me, it's not, I cannot answer a question, but I can bring more questions and also bring more attention, attention to other things that usually we were not looking at. Thank you so much, Vanessa, for this, you know, very true and, and, and correct statement. Um, Rami, do you have uh, some final words for us? How do we uh, improve or how do we address uh, fragility? Well, Okay, I think uh, the previous speakers have covered everything very adequately. I think we've heard very, very much about uh, the need for structural change. And, 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 and Vanessa has extensively described how the future relationship between urban and rural, although in many parts of the world, these notions are uh, today completely blurred. I want to just add a couple of things is that uh, uh, I, uh, there was a question that was posed uh, by Nate uh, that was never really answered about globalization and then trade restrictions and, and some kind of nationalism. And I do not see a world that is not international. Uh, or, you know, I don't see a world in which there is no global solidarity. And I want to quote here, uh, the late Samir Amin, uh, who, uh, you know, who, who published a lot on issues of the Arab world, but also on matters that had to do with the global south. I think the, the, the choice that we need to make is in what kind of world do we want to live in? Do we want to live in a, in a world that is based on competition, or do we want to live in a world that's based on solidarity? And the these, these are binary choices, I know, but they're important choices because everything we're seeing today is the product of a world that is based on competition. And if you don't change the initial premise of the world in which we are living, it's going to be extremely difficult to change anything that, uh, that uh, results from it. This is the essence of it. A world that is based on competition is the world in which we live today. No matter, no matter the amount of talk that we can hear about giving it a human face, about green capitalism, 
about using the market to improve or redress all the torts of the, the current system. This system needs changing. The big problem with it is that we have zero clue about how to go about changing it. Because the ultimate truth is that this is going to be a violent process. And by violent, I mean that the system in which we live is violent towards the individual. In order to stop it, to change it, you can expect that there will be no hold bar and that it will attack you with everything it has and that it will disguise it under humanism, under the need for a fairer and a better society. And this explains why the discourse and the narrative of all the institutions that form the basis of the system are not essentially different from the narrative and the terminology of the people who want to change it. Unless we make a choice as humans that we want to change the way things are expressed, the way we live, then we are bound to continue living in the system that continues to recreate itself without transformation. More Thank engagement, you. Martin, more engagement. Bodies on the line. <laughs> Thank you so much for this fantastic closing statement. Yes, indeed, we need more global solidarity. That's the way out. Having said this, I would like to wrap up today or for today, but next week we will have another seminar coming up where we're going to discuss, well, the second wave, not necessarily the second COVID wave, but the bigger one that's all uh, awaiting us, which is climate change and water. And we have speakers uh, such as uh, Rachel McDonald from the International Water Management Institute, Alan Nicol from the same institution, Mark Mulligan of King's College in London, Dr. Rabia Mokhtar of uh, the Dean of uh, Favs here at AUB, Cecilia Tottehada from Singapore, and Jeroen Warner from Wageningen University. They will join us for next week's uh, seminar. And then over the coming weeks, we'll have more seminars on nutrition with World P Food Prize Laureate um, uh, Lawrence Haddad and uh, with Patrick Webb from Tufts University. And then afterwards, we're going to look at, or the week after, we're going to look at the global uh, food system and how can it be made sustainable with Robert Palberg of Harvard and uh, Tom Hurtle of Purdue and also um, uh, Tony Allen in, in London. And then as our final seminar, we're going to look at, after Ramadan, at uh, food security strategies here in the region. How can we use COVID-19 as a way to change here in the Middle East? Thank you very much, and it's been a true pleasure. We can't give you a round of applause, but we're very grateful uh, for all your input. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Thank you very much. Good Thanks. luck for the other seminars. Thank you. Pleasure Thank you so you. much. Thank you so much, and uh, good luck. Thanks. Stay safe, everyone. Yes. Thanks, everyone. Good to meet you, Vanessa, Brahim, and Mustaf. We hope to see you at AUB soon, and Vanessa also, perhaps. Hope to see you soon, Dr. Zurek.